Well, good morning, everyone. Or it's, it's morning here on the East Coast, 11 o'clock in the morning. Um, thank you, everyone, who's joining in, uh, both on live on YouTube, as well as um, here on our Zoom portal, uh, for those folks who were able uh, and are continuing to come into our, our Zoom portal. Uh, my name is Chris Lewis. I'm the President and CEO at Public Knowledge. And uh, we are really glad to be able to host this hour long uh, webinar uh, about uh, connectivity uh, during the corona uh, virus uh, pandemic. And uh, I am very lucky to have three expert panelists with me who are gonna help us go through um, not only what's been uh, done so far, but uh, uh, what can be done to continue to make sure that Americans are connected uh, uh, to essential communications networks during this emergency and hopefully into the future um, and with future emergencies. Um, so I'm joined today by uh, three expert panelists. Uh, first, uh, from the Benton Foundation, uh, senior fellow John Sallet. Uh, and John uh, is also a former uh, general counsel at the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, also with us, is the founder and executive director of the Shelby Coalition, John Windhausen. Uh, we have two Johns, so I'll be using their first names, uh, or excuse me, their full names. Uh, and then uh, from public knowledge, our senior vice president, Harold Feld, is also with us. So thank you, gentlemen, for uh, taking the time out to do this. Uh, uh, we're going to do a few um, questions with our expert panelists uh, for this webinar, and then we'll have some time uh, at the end. Uh, reserved for questions from participants. So as we go along, uh, if you're in the Zoom portal, please go ahead and feel free to enter questions in uh, to the portal. And I'll be picking some out uh, as we go along uh, that hopefully uh, get us at some other topics uh, or some clarifications. And uh, I won't be identifying who asked the question so that uh, folks don't be shy about asking anything. There's no questions that are too dumb uh, or too provocative and we'll do our best uh, to get to as many as possible at the end. Uh, so let's get started. And uh, first question to all three of you guys um, is, uh, you know, the FCC a couple of weeks ago uh, acted uh, to uh, put together a, a pledge with broadband providers. It's called the Keep Americans Connected Pledge. Uh, had three basic parts, asking them not to terminate service to uh, residents or businesses, uh, if they were late on their pay uh, for, uh, for their service, uh, it waived uh, late fees for, uh, for those customers. And it also uh, was a pledge to open up Wi-Fi hotspots uh, to anyone in America who needs them. And then it had some other suggested things along with it that were not core to the pledge. But uh, when you guys have been uh, reading and hearing about this pledge, uh, is there one thing that comes to mind that you would have liked to see the FCC do uh, that you think they have the power to do? And why don't we start with John Windhausen? Well, thanks, Chris. It's a pleasure to be here with you and with everybody. Um, I mean, yeah, the FCC did a, a good, made a good first step uh, to get these commitments from the private sector not to disconnect people. Uh, and I was pleased that Chairman Pai jumped on that right away. It's similar to what other regulators have done with other industries. Uh, so it, it was a good first step, much more needs to be done. And I'd say one thing that the FCC could now do, which they haven't done yet, but which we're hoping that they would do, is to allow schools and libraries and other anchor institutions to extend their signals beyond the building to reach people at home, particularly now as the schools and libraries are largely closed, uh, they're not using their broadband to its fullest extent at their location, and there's really some capacity, a lot of broadband capacity to those institutions, and we'd love to share that with the surrounding community uh, where, you know, people are sheltering in place at home. So that's where the broadband needs to be, and we think the FCC could do more in order to promote that broadband connectivity to the home for education and learning. Great. And, t and telehealth. Uh, John Sallet, one thing for the FCC? Yes, uh, we have an enormous spike in unemployment insurance claims. Today, the report came out that there were 3.3 million claims made in the last week, made last week, and that's the highest in U.S. history. And we've got to think about eligibility for Lifeline in terms of the spike in unemployment. 
uh, we, in the Benton report we issued last year, urged that eligibility be reexamined and be simplified, for example, to be made automatic. So with this spike in unemployment, we should be thinking about how to make sure Lifeline reaches people who need it right away. For example, we should think about whether somebody who is getting unemployment insurance should be immediately el eligible for Lifeline for the period of time that he or she is getting that insurance. Because we do not want dislocation and employment to turn out to be separation from society. Okay. And then Harold, uh, do you have anything to add for the FCC? Thanks. Uh, the first thing I would point out is because of the uh, FCC's unfortunate decision to reclassify broadband as an information service rather than as a um, telecommunication service, which we're all seeing now that, yeah, this is an essential service that everybody needs to have, their options are severely limited. Uh, so there is just uh, um, somewhat limited authority to do what needs to be done. Uh, but one of the things they certainly can do, in addition to what uh, uh, both John Windhausen and John Salad have uh, uh, pointed to is gathering information. Uh, everybody is acknowledging that the network is under stress. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, that uh, we need to see where the weak points are in the network, not uh, uh, because anybody's at fault here, but because. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, but because we need to prepare both for the weeks ahead as the strain on the network continues uh, and for the uh, uh, next crisis that may occur. Aaron, take a moment there and we'll certainly come back uh, to, to that topic. Um, but why don't we go to the next question. So we've also seen action from Congress um, just late last night. Uh, Congress uh, passed uh, the third in their uh, coronavirus uh, stimulus bills, uh, uh, some people are calling it. Uh, and uh, we did see a, a few small things in there, but not uh, what uh, a lot of the advocacy community was asking for um, around broadband and connectivity. Uh, you know, there were some grants to states to provide connectivity uh, uh, and, and purchase devices. Uh, there was some in digital inclusion money. Uh, there was um, you know, some telehealth money, a little bit of telehealth money in there uh, for the FCC uh, and for some pilot programs around telehealth. Um, but we didn't see a lot more. Uh, are there things that you uh, think that Congress missed an opportunity on and should be considered? Uh, is, is there one major thing that you would recommend that would be considered for uh, any next bill that they pass around coronavirus? Uh, John Windhausen, why don't you start us off? Well, thanks, Chris. It was disappointing that Congress did not include more broadband provisions into the third stimulus bill, but we do understand that they're working on a fourth bill right now. And uh, I don't have one thing, I have five things to recommend. Uh, so really quickly, they really need to address the shortage of hotspots. I think that provides a really good first next step in trying to promote broadband connectivity, but uh, they need to appropriate money to manufacture them because there just aren't enough hotspots to go around and that funding needs to be made available now because it takes 10 to 12 weeks to to produce them. Uh, hotspots work well when there is a good cellular signal but in a lot of rural areas there isn't a good enough cellular signal. We recommend that uh, schools should be able to get EBS licenses. That's the educational broadband service so they can deploy wireless signals in these rural markets. There also needs to be a, a couple of billion dollars more for telehealth networks. This appropriation, or the, the third coronavirus bill gave a lot of money to health, but not for telehealth. And so we're gonna be recommending some significant additional funding for the FCC's rural health care program to speed uh, rural health uh, uh, broadband connectivity because the hospitals are getting overwhelmed with people using up their beds and soon the telehealth networks are going to be overwhelmed as well. So they need more broadband. Fourth, there needs to be a very large infrastructure package to build for the long run. We should be deploying high capacity, future-proof networks now. We should have done this. The National Broadband Plan called for that by 2020 and we didn't get that done. So we really need to urge Congress to appropriate that money to build for the future to avoid the next, so we're prepared for the next crisis. And then last, we need more money for digital equity. 
uh, we did get the 50 million for IMLS and that was positive, but we really need $500 million for IMLS to promote digital equity through the libraries. Okay. Uh, anything to add for Congress? Yes. Um, let me take it in two parts as, as, as John has. What we didn't see in the bill that passed yesterday was dedicated funding for kids to be connected to do their homework or older students or college students. Uh, the hut spots are an important way to solve an interim problem as John has, has explained. We don't have to rely, however, on only one solution. John's already said there are problems with the supply of hot spots. So we should be thinking in the short term about how to get K through 12 kids connected through hot spots, through subsidies for fixed broadband connections, through allowing educational institutions to reach into their neighborhoods more effectively. The bill also didn't deal with Lifeline. Right now, and we'll come back to this, I think, Chris, Lifeline funds either fixed or mobile, but 90% of it is used for mobile. People need a fixed connection. People need both. And then looking forward to the fourth stimulus bill, to an infrastructure bill, without going to all the details, and maybe we'll come back to this, what we think is Congress needs to act comprehensively. Fund deployment, where there is no broadband. And it's got to be scalable, future-proof broadband. We, we start with 100 megs down and 100 megs up symmetrical. It needs to help competition, for example, by ensuring that the 30% of Americans that live in multi-tenant environments can get choice, or also preempting laws that ban municipalities from experimenting with broadband. It needs to deal more comprehensively with affordability and adoption. And to the work that John has led the public interest community in doing, it needs to empower community anchor institutions, for example, to serve as launching pads for residential broadband built into neighborhoods. That's a big package and there'll be a lot of discussion in the days ahead, but it's gonna be critical that if we spend a lot of money this year, that the money be put to its best use over the long term. Okay, so let's pivot because we, we have started to get into some of the weeds of some of these ideas. And, and I wanna to turn to Harold, uh, because Harold, uh, you did uh, put forward uh, a proposal around, um, you know, for a short-term emergency like we're in right now, um, a concept where there could be a direct subsidy to all Americans to cover the cost of broadband. Am I describing that accurately? Why don't you give folks uh, the details of that plan? Right. And one of the things about this is um, uh, I've proposed and we public knowledge have proposed that for the duration of the crisis, we should now all recognize that um, it's not just that everybody needs broadband to participate. It's that society as a whole benefits when everyone is connected. So this is, in fact, a two way street. It's not just the benefits to the individual that we should be, you know, looking to help out those who aren't paying for it. We should be making sure that everybody has it because we're all going to benefit from having everybody online during this crisis. And not just, frankly, during this crisis, but afterwards as well. But certainly for this crisis, when we're trying to make sure that everybody stays at home, um, we've uh, proposed that. Uh, the government should just pick up the tab uh, to get everybody uh, online and connected and to ensure basic broadband. I mean, think of this as a form of health insurance, but for your broadband connection. If you're, uh, uh, the government can uh, pay $50 a month to each ISP, that'll ensure that the ISPs get paid and that we keep employees on the payroll for a basic broadband package, something like uh, hopefully better than the 25.3 that the FCC uh, describes as broadband, something um, you know that would really support the two-way communication that you need. But uh, the idea is that for the next couple of months where we need everybody at home, everybody who we can connect, because as others have pointed out, the infrastructure isn't reaching everywhere, should be connected. 
And we can do that for about five to six billion dollars a month, which you know is not something you'd want to do forever, but certainly um, if we looked at it as we're going to support the broadband industry and make sure that all the small independent broadband providers don't go out of business and even the large ones uh, or the mid-sized ones don't have to take a huge hit and uh, furlough workers or lay off workers, if we said that's going to be 18 billion to support the broadband industry, people would be a lot more supportive perhaps than saying, it's going to be $50 a month of stimulus to each individual. But the great thing about this is we're going to make $50 into $100. We're going to make everybody uh, connected and we're going to support critical infrastructure. So, you know, this is a win-win-win proposal for Congress to, uh, uh, to just go all in on uh, what everybody agrees is an essential service for getting through this. Great. John Sallett, um, we talked, you talked briefly about Lifeline. Um, and, you know, the Lifeline program, if, if folks are not familiar, is a longstanding subsidy uh, uh, program uh, for low-income Americans uh, uh, to get access to telephone and hopefully broadband services, although it's been anchored to telephone service for years. Um, can you talk about uh, some of the details that you'd like to see uh, in changing or increasing that subsidy uh, in emergencies? The most fundamental is we live in a society now where people need both mobile and fixed. Obviously, mobility is important. Parents at work want to reach their kids wherever they are. But fixed broadband is very important. Think of people at home today. Think of the people who are watching us right now do this webinar using streaming video, sometimes in households with people, with kids doing their homework or college students in online classes, people seeking health care if they're isolated. So Congress should face the fact that we now need both. And low-income people can't afford a lot. We reviewed the social science in our Benton report, and it's 10 or $15 a month. So we think what needs to happen is that Congress should ensure the Lifeline also has a fixed broadband subsidy uh, that brings costs to roughly $10 a month. It make, that subsidy should support broadband that really meets the need. Right? We used to, we, sometimes we've debated about whether broadband was must have, but today we know it's need now. People need it now, and they need it to be robust. So we've suggested, for example, that that subsidy should go to a service that's symmetrical, 50-50, or the highest up or down speeds that a network provides, if it's lower than that. Next, uh, we should require that federally funded networks become lifeline providers. And Chris, public knowledge came out with a great suggestion recently to waive rules, the ETC rules they're called, that keep consumers from applying their discounts to major cable systems. That's very important. And then uh, it's really important that Congress ensure that Lifeline can support broadband, a legal question that is currently in doubt on remand because of the net neutrality order and the D.C. Circuit saying that the commission had completely failed to explain how its authority under Section 254 could extend to broadband. And then one last point, eligibility. I talked about this a moment ago in terms of unemployment, reaching people who are getting unemployment uh, insurance. We have to make sure that eligibility is expanded as we need it. I said 3.3 people had, million people had filed for unemployment insurance, so the numbers are going to go up, but here's another number. Right now, only about 20% of eligible people are using Lifeline. So if numbers spike and the usage demand spikes, Lifeline will get bigger, and it will be very important that Congress ensures that it is fully and completely funded. Great. Thanks for the uh, acknowledgement of the public knowledge proposal. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, and also noting the importance of, of, of symmetric service that, you know, yes. 50 up or 50 down, uh, upload and download speeds, uh, which a lot of folks forget about because it hasn't been symmetric. Symmetric speeds has not been the standard uh, over the years, but when we're talking about real-time video, uh, yes. the symmetric, symmetric speeds that's needed to accomplish that, uh, which gives you 
live video, con video conferencing for companies or uh, live uh, online classes for students and the like. Right. And Tom right. Edison as well. Yes. Uh, why don't we turn to John Windhausen. John Windhausen, um, uh, I'd like to get more details from you about the E-Rate program uh, as someone who uh, is one of the, the strongest advocates uh, for connecting schools and libraries. Um, can you walk us through a bit about how you'd like to see uh, E-Rate change uh, and the details? I know it's been a fund that we've wanted to make sure is protected over the years and so people are wary of when you start talking about changes. Well, that's right, Chris. The E-Rate program has tr been tremendously successful in connecting schools and libraries, and the reforms made by the FCC over the last decade have really allowed schools and libraries to upgrade uh, their connectivity very substantially. And the FCC's endorsement of special construction and fiber uh, connectivity has been fabulous. Now I think we're at the next stage of looking at E-Rate. How can we share that capacity with the community? Because after all, the anchor institutions are there not just for themselves, but to serve the public. And we think that there are some things that the FCC can do under the current statutory language to make that capacity shared more broadly with uh, the surrounding uh, residential and small business consumers. So for instance, the FCC just did issue a, a nice clarification a couple of days ago that said schools and libraries should keep their Wi-Fi on uh, so that uh, even if the building is closed, keep the Wi-Fi on so you can still use it on campus. That's what the FCC said. We would like them to go further and say you could actually use it off campus as well. And we don't think the statute precludes that. The statutory language for the E-rate program does say it needs to be for educational purposes. But that doesn't mean only for educational purposes. It could also be as long as it's primarily for education, it can be shared on a secondary basis or an ancillary basis with the, the surrounding community. And we suggest the FCC should explicitly endorse that policy. Having said that, um, there's even more that should be done uh, beyond extending that. Uh, uh, and there is a, a question about whether the E-Rate program is the best program for getting broadband all the way to the home. And there are two different strains of thought. Uh, we, uh, we agree with both. <laughs> you know, we, there's there's a, line, a strain of thought that said, look, E-Rate is already set up. It's a program that's already in operation. Let's fund it, increase the funding to, to explicitly fund to the home. I worry a little bit about the ability of the forms and the application processes that USAC administers for the E-Rate program aren't really well designed to handle applications to bring broadband to the home. So there's another strain of thought that says, yes, there needs to be more funding, but it shouldn't go through E-Rate. We should really design the program to provide broadband connectivity straight to the home, as Harold uh, just talked about. And maybe that's not E-Rate, maybe it's a new fund within the FCC's uh, Universal Service Fund umbrella. But I don't want to quibble about, you know, which program is best suited, whether it's E-Rate or a new program. The overriding objective is uh, we need broadband everywhere. It should be ubiquitous, it should be affordable, it should be open to the general public and accessible. And we very strongly support the idea that the E-Rate program can, the FCC can do more under the existing statute to make that available. Great, thank you, John. Uh, so Harold, uh, you are uh, probably our panel's uh, greatest expert on spectrum policy. And, um, and a lot of people, um, you know, we talked about the importance of both, you know, wired and uh, mobile connections. Uh, you know, can you go give us a couple ideas about uh, how spectrum can uh, help uh, increase uh, access to broadband, uh, some of the changes we might uh, be able to make? Right, and we're seeing uh, right now in the field two things that are very important. One is we desperately need more unlicensed spectrum to support Wi-Fi 6. Um, the yeah, amount of capacity we need, uh, if you read all of these uh, articles that have been coming about out uh, in the last couple of days about the strain on the networks. One of the things you read about is how do you like make your Wi-Fi uh, better and more efficient because we've got all this congestion here and if you have good 
connectivity coming into your house and then it hits the Wi-Fi access point and it slows down, that's not doing you a lot of good. So uh, the first thing that has to happen is we've got two proceedings in front of the FCC, um, the six gigahertz proceeding, the 5.9 gigahertz proceeding, the FCC should move very quickly uh, uh, on those uh, so that we can get these new devices out. But um, we're also seeing that the I guess what we would call flexibility in spectrum use. We've seen the FCC authorize use for uh, the uh, wireless carriers to use unused spectrum that DISH is using to build out its network, uh, and that's helped them to meet the challenges because wireless networks are also experiencing this huge uh, surge. So, uh, and you know, why, wireless hotspots, once we have them, if we're loading all this traffic on them, um, we're going to need, number one, the Wi-Fi spectrum so that all those devices can connect to the wireless hotspot. And then we're going to need the license spectrum for the wireless hotspot to connect to the wireless network. So how do we increase that flexibility? Uh, we need uh, uh, something that we've been pushing for years in this area that's called user share, uh, where if there's spectrum that is not currently in use, uh, the yeah, even if it's licensed spectrum, the licensee would make that available through a database and say, hey, I'm not using this yet. Um, people can use it until I indicate that I'm actually uh, going to be using it. Uh, and then let uh, those who need it come in and say, okay, well, let's use that until you who actually have the license for it are ready to deploy so it doesn't you know, just lie there fallow. Uh, we can also do a lot of things that the FCC can do right now without breaking this kind of new ground. So, for example, uh, we have systems in rural areas where um, we have uh, uh, problems with uh, just we haven't got enough uh, towers deployed. Uh, we could do things like temporary uh, uh, authority to increase power levels in these areas so that uh, uh, we could... Uh, um, you know, have uh, stronger broadband uh, available. We can uh, uh, move to uh, make, uh, um, you know, uh, more uh, TV white spaces uh, available uh, and allow for regional, uh, um, you know, higher power uh, to, uh, uh, because we know that there isn't a lot of TV uh, signal out there that we're interfering with and that sort of thing um, can uh, make an enormous difference in areas where uh, these are uh, the um, the only connectivity that's there is provided by a local wireless ISP um, or uh, is provided uh, to people who have uh, cellular networks, particularly from uh, independent rural uh, uh, cellular networks, and we should look at how uh, we can boost their uh, power in the short term. This is uh, something that uh, the FC did in, FCC did in Katrina. Um, they waived a lot of the rules around uh, uh, tower siting or uh, around uh, power levels and, you know, really uh, moved expeditiously. And I think uh, um, we can do a lot of that here. The FCC is doing some of that now, and I think uh, we can do a lot more. Great. And John Windhausen, quickly, I know uh, public knowledge, we've worked with you uh, and others to support uh, expanding access to spectrum uh, for uh, schools and, and educational institutions as well. Uh, can you give us an update on uh, on that topic, the, uh, the EBS uh, spectrum ban, I believe it's called? Yes, thanks, Chris. I mentioned that earlier, and if I could just expound on that a little bit. Uh, the educational broadband service spectrum has been dedicated for educational uses since the 1960s. Um, and we would love to be able to preserve that uh, benefit. And I think the educational need is even greater now with this crisis and, and students who don't have connectivity at the school now need that connectivity at home. And the 2.5 gigahertz spectrum where the EBS band is, is very amenable uh, to uh, providing that connectivity and providing high bandwidth to those consumers. Um, we need the, uh, the licenses to be issued to the schools though and these educational institutions. The private sector already has a substantial amount of spectrum in these rural markets that they're not using. And so they've had a chance to deploy it, but where the cell phone signals aren't strong enough, you need to give those licenses to entities that have a real incentive to solve that problem. And we think the schools and the state educational agencies and the nonprofit educational institutions, their mission 
is to solve that homework gap. Now our measure of the homework gap is somewhere between six and seven million uh, students at home don't have broadband, others are say 12 million. Whatever the number is, it's a really large number. 10 to 20% of all school children don't have access at home. So that is a really significant problem. And the EBS spectrum, some people are telling me that is the silver bullet for some of these rural markets, that the technology is available off the shelf. It's tried and true. There are several school systems that have already deployed it successfully. And so that could be a really low cost way, but the schools need the license and the FCC has the power. Unfortunately, the FCC chose not to give it to the schools in an order from last uh, uh, summer. The Shelby Coalition filed a petition for reconsideration a few months ago asking the FCC to take another look at that. And that's, that second look is even more vitally important now uh, because that could be a really great way to solve this homework gap in a very short period of time. Fantastic. Um, John uh, Sallett, uh, you touched on this uh, uh, in our first round of, of kind of uh, early topics, but uh, I'd love to hear more from you about um, uh, your ideas around, because I know you've written about this as well in some of your papers uh, at the Benton Foundation, uh, but your ideas around uh, how we make sure that all consumers have uh, real choices uh, and competition in the marketplace for broadband. Uh, you know, I know there are studies that show that uh, just so many consumers really just have maybe one or two options for broadband. I know I only have one option for high-speed broadband where I live, and it's not, an, it's not a rural area either. So, uh, John, can you tell us more about that? Sure, thank you, Chris. Uh, it's true, Chris, the latest FCC data we've seen says something like 80% of Americans have either one provider, which means no choices, or two providers, which means one. I attended a citizens group in the community you live in, Chris, a couple of weeks ago, because people there with one want to figure out how to get the benefits of competition. And they know competition brings prices lower, brings quality higher, brings innovation faster. So there's things Congress can do to promote competition. Let me go through just a few. One is to preempt state laws that bar municipalities from experimenting with broadband deployment. This isn't to say every community should do it. And it's certainly not to say there's only one way. What's interesting, and we talk about it in our report, is how many different kinds of models there are around the country of public-private collaboration. But that experimentation at the local level is critical. Secondly, I mentioned this before, 30% of Americans live in multi-tenant environments. That could be in a classic apartment house. It could be a gated community in some places. It could be all sorts of pieces, but places where there's common ownership and multiple tenancies or residences. The FCC has been thinking about this, but there's a package of things that could be done basically to make sure that people in their homes can exercise choice, that they're not locked into a particular provider. Thirdly, when federal funding comes, for example, in the stimulus bill number four, it needs to fund last mile, and as I said before, scalable last mile that will meet the demands of the decade. But it should also make sure that there's open access middle mile networks, because those are the networks that can go deep into a community, to schools or libraries, and lower the cost of build out to residential areas that are nearby, a school in a neighborhood, is an obvious launching pad for competition. Fourth, we should stop talking about overbuilding because it's obscuring the issue and isn't saying what's going on. In the stimulus package that was passed last night, there's $100 million for the USA Reconnect program. It's an important program, but it has this quality. It only puts funds into places have 10-1 service or lower. Now, the FCC's current definition of broadband is 25-3. So we have a broadband blind spot, people between 10-1 and 25-3, and according to FCC data, there's something like 10 million Americans there. It, it doesn't make sense to exclude them. It does make sense to have prioritization, right? Build places where there's no reasonable broadband and then go to places that have some, 
And there are states that are doing that, but it doesn't make sense to have uh, none at all. And so with, 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 these, with these kinds of efforts, and I should say the states include places like Minnesota that prioritize and others, other steps. Congress can open up markets to more competition, which is the best way consumers benefit. Okay, uh, we're gonna do a couple more and then we'll turn to questions. So uh, folks who are watching uh, using the Zoom portal, please don't be shy about uh, entering questions into the Q&A uh, function and I'll be picking questions out of there. We already have some coming in, uh, so we appreciate those. Uh, but before we turn to that, uh, a couple more. Uh, first, with Harold, um, uh, you know, uh, there, there's a, a lot of talk about, you know, this emergency right now and, and what we need to do to make sure that uh, people are connected, you know, right now during uh, times when they're uh, uh, socially distancing and teleworking from home. Uh, but are there lessons that we should be learning uh, during this period for future emergencies uh, or for um, uh, uh, just for everyday broadband? Uh, and, and how do we learn those lessons? Can you talk to us a bit about the idea of what data needs to be collected? Well, yes. I mean, everyone has been referring to this as the stress test of the uh, uh, internet and our broadband infrastructure. And it's important not that just that this be graded on a pass fail, but that we actually learn from it so that we can prepare, we can see the places where our national infrastructure is weak and needs to be upgraded and we can uh, uh, find all of the potential choke points in the network. And looking at this, we can see essentially three primary places where there are likely to be choke points in the network. The first, as I mentioned earlier, is the Wi-Fi access point. This is where most of us are connecting uh, to our network, um, or if you're using a uh, uh, mobile device on one of the uh, uh, wireless carriers, this will be at the tower. There are natural limits uh, just based on uh, what spectrum is available. We need to see what's happening with congestion. We need to verify um, how this is working uh, and, uh, you know, uh, learn so that we can understand what behavior is like um, in these sorts of situations, how people are uh, uh, accessing the internet, and what uh, uh, kind of a spectrum balance uh, we need to uh, be striking going forward. Uh, next is how is the last mile operating? The different types of technology. I mean, everybody is sort of generally saying, well, you know, fiber will be fine, upgraded cable will be fine, older DSL systems or older cable systems will struggle. Um, we need to know. We need to know how this is working out. We need to see um, with real data what how the networks are handling, particularly how um, they're handling the massive surge in upstream traffic as well as the even uh, you know cable networks like that are running DOCSIS 3 and have been upgraded are still designed on an asymmetric model rather than a symmetric model and as we're seeing a lot more symmetric traffic um, we are going to need to uh, uh, see how the networks handle that um, and uh, um, this is all going to be important data. Um, we will see essentially sort of a heat map, if you will, of where we have strong networks and good broadband and where we need to upgrade our national network. Finally, and one of the trickiest point is the interconnection points, the places where these last mile networks are handing off to the cloud. Uh, these are um, the places that are most vulnerable to this kind of surge traffic and have the widest impact. Uh, if people remember five years ago when we had uh, uh, the Netflix dispute with a number of the largest ISPs where uh, Netflix was uh, uh, coming in through uh, the interconnection points and the ISPs were refusing to upgrade and that standoff slowed all incoming traffic because it's like a tidal wave hitting a, uh, a sewer grate. It just can't all flow through at once. 
And those are the places where we've seen in Europe uh, reports of a lot of stress, um, where uh, uh, it would be important to know what capacity we have so that um, since uh, that's a place where it's hard to expand physical capacity uh, and balance capacity uh, in a short-term surge. Um, we're going to need to see, once the data is in, um, whether our current uh, architecture can handle it, and if not, what we need to do in order to make sure we can handle these sorts of emergencies going forward. Great. And, and to piggyback on that, John Sallet, you know, uh, speaking of what the networks can handle, uh, you know, one of the, not the core parts of the FCC's uh, voluntary Keep America Connected pledge, uh, but one of the recommendations was around uh, lifting data caps. Uh, and, and we've written about data caps for years of public knowledge, um, are concerned that they can be used in any competitive ways, uh, that they should be looked at uh, by, by the FCC. Uh, but we're seeing a lot of the, the providers in this emergency lifting their data caps. Um, what can we learn from that? Uh, uh, you know, and, and is this something that should be investigated further about how data caps uh, impact uh, traffic on the network? Data caps have been a focus of attention from the FCC for a long time, right? It was a past merger where the FCC was concerned that data caps could be used by an incumbent cable provider to prevent cable substitutes from coming over the internet, right? So how they operate and whether they benefit consumers is important. Let's talk about fixed broadband networks, which have significant capacity. Um, the FCC should be understanding what happens with the networks. Uh, it ought to be looking at what kind of data caps there are. So let me make two points. One is we have carriers doing good things right now. Comcast, T-Mobile, Charter, Dish, I'm sure I'm leaving some out by mistake, but really good actions, including open access networks, for example, Wi-Fi or cable access during the emergency. What's the emergency? How long is the emergency? This is going to turn out to be an important question. When society starts to reopen, but still very many people are likely to be working from home, or there are uh, college kids who are not going back to campuses, is that still going to be the emergency? The SEC ought to be talking to carriers to make sure that the solutions last as long as the problem. And that may not be a binary cutoff that one day people go to work and another day they don't, or one day non essential businesses are closed and the next day they're open. The second thing the FCC should do, and this goes right back to the really important comments that Harold just made. The FCC talks to carriers every day, or they should be. The carriers are paying a lot of attention to the demands on their networks, when demand is high, when it's low, how they're managing their bandwidth. The FCC should be talking to the carriers, and they should be working out what's going on in the networks so they can tell us. We need to know what the networks can handle, what they're doing to increase capacity. That will tell us what we can do at home. And it will go to the question you rightly asked, which is, have we learned that data caps on fixed broadband networks just aren't justified anymore? Okay, thank you, John. And, uh, and you know, it, I think it was, I think it was John Winhausen who noted earlier, you know, how long it's been. I think it's about, been about 10 years since uh, we passed the, or, or, or since the FCC created the National Broadband Plan. Um, and we've been talking about getting the entire country connected to broadband for many, many years, not just that decade, but even before that. Um, and so to see, you know, this issue raised up as a uh, uh, important in this crisis just shows us how much further we have to go. There was an uh, article in the New York Times uh, this morning about how folks are seeing because of the traffic, uh, there are some anecdotes out there about uh, 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 adjustments needing to be made to video in order to, for everyone to uh, be able to uh, use the network. And so these are sorts of things that, you know, I really hope uh, the FCC will study. Um, and as we figure out how to get better broadband deployed to everyone, uh, really raise standards so that everyone can uh, 
can choose to telework or choose to take advantage of broadband even when we're not in an emergency. We're gonna to turn to some questions from um, uh, our audience. Uh, please continue to put them into the, the Q&A uh, portal, uh, but I'm gonna take a few here. Uh, and the first one probably, uh, John Windhouse is probably perfect for you. Um, uh, this person talks about how at the local level, uh, a lot of folks are relying on various low income uh, home internet offers. Um, uh, which are very helpful for K-12 students, um, as well as uh, they're relying on public Wi-Fi in some communities. Uh, and so this person asks, uh, what else might be available for individuals who might fall through the cracks uh, for reasons of ineligibility or impracticality? Uh, they highlight seniors and college students. Mm. Well, this I think gets to the digital, uh, digital literacy training, digital equity component, because uh, yes, there is a, uh, the industry are, some of the industry members are offering some discounted plans for, for low income people. Um, and th that's, that's great when they're doing so. Not every provider is actually doing that. Uh, and even when the carriers and providers are making those discount uh, offerings uh, available, they're not advertising them very well. And so there's a lack of awareness, and especially for seniors who are already sometimes intimidated by this technology, you know, getting over that hump of trying to figure out how to make a broadband, how to sign up for broadband connection, how to get the devices to work, uh, it can be very daunting. And this is not just a local problem, this is a national problem. You know, it gets back to the network effects, the more people who are on the network, the more everybody benefits. So we ought to be taking this on as a national priority to make sure that people have the education that they need and the training they need and the devices and the software and, and work with people that can help set them up. Libraries in particular have done a very good job of making their training available to the people in their jurisdictions, but of course now the libraries are often closed. So how can we fill that gap? Well, that's why we need uh, some additional funding to help promote these awareness campaigns and the efforts of local digital inclusion offices around the United States. NDIA, the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, is a great organization that has captured hundreds of these local organizations, and they're all working with different communities, uh, uh, those who speak different languages and senior communities, low-income communities, uh, but their needs tend to vary based upon their local circumstances. And so we shouldn't try to design a one size fits all national approach, but we do need to, the federal government can provide the funding to these local organizations. And that is so important these days. I think the anchor institutions are well positioned to be helpful, but the schools for instance right now are really uh, working hard to develop the digital content to be able to provide students online education and the schools are dealing with distributing lunches. So those are two essential functions that the schools now have to reorient their operations to deal with this crisis situation. So the schools themselves may not be in the best position to do a whole lot of digital literacy, digital training work. That's where the libraries really come in and other community support organizations. So we're very hopeful, as I mentioned in this next uh, stimulus bill, the fourth stimulus bill, that we really need to get some federal funding flowing and it needs to fund uh, to, to flow quickly. You know, this is not something that should be, okay, let's set up a long rulemaking process to figure this out. This really needs to be expedited uh, to get uh, this information into the hands and get people connected as quickly as possible. Great, and, and nice shout out to um, our friends at the National Digital Inclusion Alliance. Uh, Public Knowledge had the pleasure of working with them just over a year ago um, on a tool that I think is available on their website uh, uh, that you can share in your local communities. Uh, it's about uh, the different low income uh, broadband programs that are available uh, and talks a bit about the policies around low income uh, broadband access. So uh, definitely recommend it. Um, uh, for folks who are looking to share that information in their communities. Uh, Harold, here's one that uh, I think, you know, be really helpful for you to weigh in on. Uh, one of the viewers asks, uh, they're asking about the FCC uh, processes, uh, which I know you're very experienced with, um, and asking if it makes sense for the FCC because of the COVID-19 emergency to uh, pause uh, their uh, their comment periods uh, and some of their processes 
uh, around uh, proceedings, uh, either because of connectivity issues or just because of the emergency generally. I don't know if you have any views on that. Uh, well, it depends. Um, you know, I certainly think that uh, um, there are uh, uh, a number of factors here. First, where there are non-critical uh, uh, proceedings, just the strain on FCC staff uh, who are working from home and, uh, uh, like everyone else, uh, are uh, uh, short-staffed and are having difficulty. Um, and they uh, so non-critical work should certainly uh, uh, be put on hold where possible. Um, the uh, 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 proceedings where uh, I think it would uh, uh, that are close to uh, conclusion, um, you know, there's no reason why uh, where those uh, shouldn't be uh, uh, wrapped up um, or where they're important to the current crisis, like the uh, uh, six gigahertz order that everybody has been hoping will be on the April uh, agenda um, and which would allow, well, would have immediate impact uh, should move forward. Uh, but uh, uh, things like the, um, you know, uh, the, the kind of routine business that the FCC does, um, you want to put that on hold, uh, allow staff to shift to processing uh, emergency uh, special temporary authorities or other temporary requests, uh, allow the routine filing of reports to be uh, suspended because staff at uh, um, your uh, television and cable uh, uh, broadcasters are just not going to be uh, available in the usual way to fill these out. Uh, the FCC has done this in the past with regard to uh, um, uh, their uh, uh, national disasters or regional disasters. Uh, so uh, certainly it would make sense uh, for the FCC to just issue uh, um, a, a kind of blanket list of all of these deadlines are uh, just automatically delayed two months and uh, um, you know, the FCC will take, uh, will prioritize the following types of requests. Thank you, Harold. Uh, John Sallet, uh, you're probably perfect for this one uh, as a former general counsel uh, at the FCC. Uh, but, uh, we have a viewer who is asking about the FCC's authority. Uh, you know, I noted that the Keep America, or yeah, Keep America Connected plan was voluntary. It was a request by the FCC, and we're, we're glad that so many uh, providers have voluntary, voluntarily, barely, eh, excuse me, voluntarily participated in it. Uh, but uh, this person asks, does the FCC have subpoena power, or what power does it have to uh, push network providers to take actions, uh, to provide data, that, that sort of thing? I think I'm uh, providing data. Well, first of all, I think if the FCC needs data to understand what's happening to the nation's broadband networks, the carriers will provide it voluntarily. But to answer the hypothetical question, the legal question, uh, Section 4I of the Communications Act is important. It's not much talked about, but here's what it says. The commission may perform any and all acts, make such rules and regulations, and issue such orders not inconsistent with this act as may, as may be necessary in the execution of its functions. Now clearly, the FCC has need for information to assess whether it takes action, information about how broadband networks are handling capacity. For example, the recent orders the FCC put out giving temporary access to spectrum was based on its understanding of the needs of the networks these days. So an order, if it came to it, which I don't think it would, an order under Section 4I to collect the information necessary so the FCC can make judgments would be completely within the ambit of the Communications Act. Thank you. Um, and folks, we got about five minutes left, and really there are no dumb questions, so throw them in there, uh, and we'll see how many more we can get to. Um, Harold, uh, this, this question makes me think of you, uh, but if others want to weigh in as well, uh, please. Uh, there's questions about uh, existing networks resiliency. Um, uh, that, uh, you know, if we are working to flatten the curve uh, and shelter in place over a long period of time, what can be done to harden networks, uh, make sure that uh, power supply to them uh, is, is stable. Uh, we've seen networks go down uh, in uh, natural disasters. Um, but we've also, also seen communities where networks have uh, uh, 
gone out and the network has not been maintained uh, well by the network provider. So Harold, uh, can you weigh in on the reliability and uh, resiliency of the network? Well, yes, uh, I think that uh, um, it's critically important here. And I'll say this is one of the reasons why we've opposed the E-Frontier uh, Act, which was Ted Cruz's uh, act that says the government can't be involved, the federal government can't be involved in the provision of any kind of wholesale or retail um, broadband network because one of the steps that we can take is there's a lot of federal fiber out there um, where uh, there are shortages of uh, fiber networks to carry uh, the traffic where networks are being overloaded. It may be possible for federal uh, networks or state networks uh, to step up uh, and step in. So uh, oftentimes these networks are prohibited from uh, uh, providing any kind of private uh, service by their terms of service, and, uh, but uh, in this crisis, um, you know, every uh, state and all of the federal agencies should be looking to see how they can support um, the uh, uh, local providers to uh, uh, see what can be done to promote network resiliency. Um, it's also the case that I would uh, uh, urge all uh, uh, state governors and others to consider uh, network repair crews uh, to be essential personnel um, that uh, of course this means that they should also uh, receive whatever protective gear is necessary um, the uh, uh, in order uh, to protect themselves uh, from uh, infection but uh, we need to understand that uh, these are essential services um, and uh, to the extent that uh, um, you know, crews can be mobilized um, in the same way that we mobilize them uh, during uh, natural disaster, um, then uh, they should be. Uh, one of the biggest problems is that as we see these, uh, uh, where, where the network is weak to the extent that uh, we can very quickly deploy um, uh, wireless links or other things to supplement existing uh, uh, rotting copper networks, that should be uh, encouraged and facilitated. Um, and uh, uh, we should um, you know, do everything in our power to make sure that uh, um, where we are finding that networks are failing, um, that uh, we uh, act quickly uh, to prop them up and have the crews to do so. Great. Thank you, Harold. Um, and one more quick one, um, and then we will wrap things up. Uh, I don't know if anyone, I'll open it up if any of you three on the panel want to talk about it, but uh, there's a comment here about uh, the importance of waivers and expedited local permitting for broadband providers, uh, which has been you know, controversial between the FCC and local uh, uh, communities and their local elected officials over the last year or so. Um, uh, can you talk about how that helps but uh, also, are there counterbalancing concerns there? Um, who would like to tackle that? No volunteers? Harold? No, okay, yeah, you know, I think that uh, all communities are very eager to be working together here. Uh, uh, certainly, uh, communities uh, ought to be uh, uh, considering what they can do uh, um, to waive short-term uh, requirements um, in order to facilitate uh, um, you know, uh, uh, deployment of new infrastructure uh, where it's necessary uh, to move things along. At the same time, uh, this shouldn't just be an excuse to uh, um, you know, uh, run uh, roughshod uh, over uh, um, you know, necessary uh, processes. Uh, so for everyone, it's a uh, balancing act. I think this is the sort of thing that really should be left to state and local authorities rather than uh, the FCC trying to do some kind of blanket uh, um, you know, uh, uh, move because the situation will be so uh, you know, unique in every local, uh, I mean, it's really gonna be a case by case uh, sort of decision um, and uh, it's exactly the kind of uh, thing that the FCC is not set up to handle and should not be uh, uh, addressed through some kind of blanket rule. John Winhausen, I know you have uh, probably folks you work with that want rapid deployment, maybe concerned about this. Well, it is uh, a balance that you have to strike between those, you know, we want these networks to, to be deployed quickly. 
Uh, but we also don't want a federal one-size-fits-all solution or mandate on the access to rights of way. So, but there does need to be encouragement for local officials to make those rights of way available on a non-discriminatory basis. Uh, but having said that, Chris, could I make one last point on telehealth? I well, know we are out of time. Can you do it in 30 seconds? I can, yes. There are four universal service fund programs that the FCC administers. The rural health care program is the smallest of those four, and that's really unfortunate. The current applications were filed last June before anyone knew that there was going to be this coronavirus crisis. So the rural health providers really need the authority to upgrade their broadband capacity right now, immediately, in order to be able to handle this. And this is something that the FCC and Congress really need to take on immediately. Thank you, John. Thank you for that plug. Um, I want to thank John Sallett, John Windhausen, uh, Public Knowledge Zone, Harold Feld, uh, for doing this hour-long webinar with us. Uh, I want to flag for folks out there who um, may be watching who are, um, you know, outside the Beltway and want to weigh in, we have an action at Public Knowledge. If you go to www.publicknowledge.org slash fund our broadband, uh, you can use that to contact Congress and tell them just how important it is to put all of these sorts of broadband proposals into the next wave that we're expecting, uh, the next stimulus bill around the coronavirus. Um, you can also check out uh, John Windhausen. John, uh, do you have a website to plug? Sure, it's www.shlb.org. For the Shelby Coalition. And, and John Sallett, you're at the Benton Foundation. Oh, we got a- John's muted. Sorry, John, I think I might have pressed at the same time. You no, did. no, no, I was, too, I was too excited at the possibility of, answer, of answering the question, Chris. I didn't unmute myself. Yes, Benton Institute for Broadband and Society at benton.org. Fantastic. We've got materials up from our report dealing with the issues that have been discussed today. Great. Uh, we love your latest report. Uh, folks should go there and check it out. Uh, and of Thank course, Harold uh, is available at the Public Knowledge website, as well as his wonderful wet machine blog that I know uh, the real nerds love to read. So thank you for that, Harold. Um, folks, we appreciate you tuning in, and hopefully we'll be able to do more of these as we are uh, uh, sequestered in our various locations throughout the pandemic. But thank you. And we'll talk to you Thank later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.